family. Our first song this morning will be number 42. 42.
invite you to worship with us whenever possible. Our building is located at Fourth and Magnolia in Pittsburgh. Our uh, South Pittsburgh. Our visitors are asked to fill out a visitor's card located on the back of the pew. Please drop this in the collection plate when it is passed. We meet each Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and 6 p.m. for worship. We have Bible classes for all ages following our morning worship service. We also meet on Wednesdays at 7 for Bible study. The purpose of the Church of Christ is to uphold the Bible as the Word of God and exalt Christ, the Son of God, and we urge all to come Christians in the New Testament way. A CD or a DVD of today's sermon is available upon request. Free, just call 837-6088. Others serving the worship this morning, Fred Majors is leading our singing. Our opening prayer will be led by Brother David Francis. I'll be speaking at the proper time. Bill Shapley will have our closing prayer. We uh, have a uh, May 13th and 14th, that's this Friday and Saturday, the Dunlap congregation will be hosting a seminar with Dave Miller. May the 15th, next Sunday uh, night, we will be having a uh, graduation dinner for Peyton, and uh, group number one is in charge. Peyton Halley also uh, has a couple of honors that I wasn't aware of until Wednesday night, and that is she's been voted to Miss John Pittsburgh High School. And that is uh, something to be very proud of. She's also in the top ten. She's graduating with honors. And so we've got a lot to be thankful for. And Peyton, I just want you to know that of everybody that's attended here, you are my favorite senior by far. I just want you to know that. I hope I didn't hurt too many feelings with that. May the 15th through the 18th, there'll be a gospel meeting at the Hooker Congregation with their new preacher, Dalton Gilreed. May 29th through June 1st, Bridgeport will be having a gospel meeting as well with Lonnie Jones. Most of our younger folks are familiar with him because of his uh, uh, activities in the CYC program. June the 5th through the 9th is our vacation Bible school, and that'll be here before you know it. Everything's in order, and we should be able to get ready to work for that very quickly. On a very, very great note, very happy note, uh, Cade Holman, who is the Cade Holman, who is the grandson of Jim Helm, obeyed the gospel last night, and we're just so thankful for that. I know the angels in heaven rejoice, and I know that a couple of folks I know live up on the mountain rejoice as well, as long as they're Mama and Daddy down in the valley as well. So we're very happy for them. At this time, we'll have our closing prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your great name. Father, we thank you so much for the, all of the many blessings and privileges and freedoms that we have in this world as we continue to honor you and glorify you and the chance to do so. Father, we ask you to give us courage to try to carry on in the many temptations and the many varieties of things that we're confronted with, the young people and the older, as well as the workplaces and the schools. And Father, we ask you to give us the strength to hold, to hold our values and to continue to try to grow in spirit and in truth as we try to serve you and looking forward to that great day. Father, we, in this congregation, we thank you so much for the many people involved in giving of their time and as these these vacation Bible school and studies at home and the teachers going on, uh, ongoing things. Father, we ask you that to bless everyone's chance to study your word and try to get a better grip on the truth as you would have us interpret it. Father, also as we continue to worship this morning, we ask you to be with Ron as he presents the lesson with everyone in the viewing audience that we have us to help us all to have attentive ears and minds. And Father, as as many of us, we have many sick and afflicted in our brotherhood as well as our local congregation. And we ask you to make a special look again at their lives and that if it be your will that they not be healed, then help them to, to tolerate the pains and relief the pain if it's at all possible. We ask you to bless everyone's health here if it be your will. And we have so much work to do and so much improvement to do with our, in the status of our society and, and life and help us to continue to try to get, come up with, with thoughts and things that would help us to be a set a better example with our words and deeds. Father, we ask you as we continue to worship this morning, forgive our sins. We need, have so much need of this great gift of forgiveness. In Christ's name we pray.
17. Number 17. She made a motion after she pushed so hard to get it through Congress, you know, to have it uh, be, become a national holiday. She made a, she, she likewise tried to get it stopped. She said people weren't doing the very things that, you know, she wanted done, you know, of course it's a free country. But uh, I just found that amazing. She pushed to have Mother's Day stopped. Well, I'm glad that we have Mother's Day. And for all you mothers out there, we are indeed very, very thankful for you. It just so happens that uh, Friday, sermons that uh, a friend of mine by the name of uh, Eddie Craft preached up at Wheeler Hill, and I think every uh, preacher probably has this sermon or one very clo uh, close to it in his arsenal. I know Johnny preached one here that was not a whole lot different. Uh, I think he has like stop signs or something like that, roadblocks perhaps. Uh, this here was his title was Blockades to Hell, and I just found it to be interesting because in there he talks about what God has done and how he helps us. Uh, stay away from hell. And of course, the first thing, parents, uh, God's love is a blockade when we learn about how much he's concerned for us. Of course, Jesus' love and how he went to the cross, that's a reason, you know, that's something that we see and we realize, well, we don't need to go to hell. And then we see the Bible and, you know, all the things that it tells us to do, another blockade. Uh, elders in the Lord's church and the church itself are all hindrances for people going to hell. We stand between people in hell. We stand between folks not knowing the truth and knowing the truth, and then heaven. And, the, and God tells us about heaven through his word, and there is, that's something that motivates us to obviously not want to go to uh, hell, and then hell itself. But this parents, we want to break that down for a moment. Parents consist of fathers and mothers. And I know sometimes people nowadays probably want to give you a duh, but we're getting into a time in our country where well, we're just not real secure about that anymore. Uh, we're not sure that the family's made up of a male father and a female mother and then the children. Uh, we, we can't even figure out which bathroom we need to use when we're out in public. Absolutely amazing that our society would degenerate as it has. And I believe that one of the reasons it has is because, well, mothers aren't mothering and daddies sure aren't daddying. So these blockades to hell, if the, the home doesn't stay as God would have it, then one of these barriers that God has put up to try to, you know, warn people, raise them up right so they know the difference between right and wrong, they have respect for authority and things of that nature, falls down. And what's so bad is this is kind of like ground, you know, ground level. This is foundational. If you don't have that foundation set, it can cause problems. And that doesn't mean that it has to be that way. Uh, my mother was not a Christian. I actually led her to Christ. I'm very thankful for that, that she obeyed the gospel. She didn't know the Christ. She didn't know the Bible. And, of course, I had the opportunity to know the Bible and to share that with her. And so I'm very thankful for that. That doesn't mean because these roadblocks sometimes fail that some others aren't there to help catch you. But we want to focus in on mothers. The idea of the father being the head of the family is true. And the mother certainly has to be the heart. 
Jesus thought mothers were very important. As a matter of fact, uh, our, our Lord, when he was on the cross, the seven sayings of the cross, number three, he talks about his mama. First one, he talks about humanity in general. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then he gets specific with one of the thieves. When the thief says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he says, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And then the third thing, he looks at his mama who's standing by the apostle John. And he says these words. Whom he loved, of course, that's being John. He saith unto the woman, he said unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Now that is a literal translation of, of the word that we find, uh, aguna. And uh, the, the idea there is female. It can, uh, it can mean mother, it can mean, uh, you know, he's talking, I guess what I'm trying to say is he's not being disrespectful. I know a lot of times when we read John 2, Jesus would say, woman, uh, uh, what have I to do with thee? My time has not yet come, talking about the, before the miracle at Cana. Uh, he's not being disrespectful, he's simply addressing her as female, as, as his mama. And so he says, behold thy son, and then he said to the disciple, behold thy mother, and from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. In other words, he was wanting to make sure that his mother was taken care of. I just find that so interesting that the first three sayings that Jesus says on the cross is about other people. People in general, Father, forgive them for they know what to do. The thief on the cross, his mama. And then finally, he mentions something about himself in number four when he says, I thirst. Of course, the fifth saying, he says, Father, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he says, it is finished. And then the last statement, of course, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. There are seven sayings of Jesus. One, of course, was talking about his mama. No one in our lives as, as selflessly sacrifices as, as a mother does. First of all, she shares her body with another to conceive. Then she shares her body with the offspring as the offspring, as the child grows within her. Shares in nourishing and raising the child. Shares in the heartaches and happiness to, uh, of that child and, until death. Mom will be there with you. One of my favorite stories, and I like to preach it every now and then, but I got put years in between it because of uh, it's one of Saul's wives. And even after her children are dead, they hang her children up. You know, they were the king's sons, so they're in, they are an example. And so for about six months, she stays out watching over their bodies as they hang, running the birds off and stuff so they won't eat their flesh. Just a mama's love is, is uh, unreal. And see, that's one of the things the Bible mentions the idea of natural affection twice. Once in the book of Romans and once in the writings of Timothy. When Paul says you got a society that's in trouble, when you, and it doesn't say natural affection, it says without natural affection. You see, natural affection, a mother that has a child, that, that's part of her. That is her, uh, she carries the child, she delivers the child. It's a part of her. And so it's natural for her to have a great affection. As a matter of fact, be willing to lay down her life for that child. And Paul says that's the way it ought to be. And you run into some real problems in a country when mamas don't see fit to love their children. And, you know, people look at abortion and things of that nature and say, well, that's just, you know, a woman's choice, things of this nature. That is as deep into without natural affection as you can get. Here you have a baby that's not even born yet, so dependent upon its mother for life, and yet she doesn't do that. That's, that's a big sign that you have a country that's uh, without natural affection. Notice the qualities here we talk about a mother. That goes against that. It has been said you can measure the morality of a nation by looking at its women. They control the morality of the nation. Men generally will go as far and do as much as they possibly can that the women will allow them. And so when you have a problem in the country with things such as fornication, premarital sex, uh, out of child, you know, uh, out of marriage uh, births and things of that nature, then, you know, you can always look back for the most part. And ladies, you know, I, I hate to point fingers. Men, men are, <laughs> we're right there too. We're about as bad as you can get. But generally, men are controlled to some degree by the hand that rocks the cradle, by the women. And ladies, you see the problems we have in society, a lot of it can be attributed to the fact that our women are not what they were years ago. What do we need to do about that? We need to do the same thing we need to do about the men. We need to change it. We need to change it. One of the things that as I run across people more often, I find people living together. And that's one of the things that, you know, really I try to, I especially try to coach young ladies in that. I'm like, you know, if you don't get him to marry you, he won't. 
Why should he take on the responsibility and the legal responsibility and things of that nature? And yet, ladies today are okay with that. We live in an open society where anybody can just do with anything, anybody they want to. And it is killing us. It is killing us at the very foundation and core of our country. We don't have a mama and a daddy raising up the children, the father there to put the fear of God in the children and help them to understand authority and what it's all about, to be the backbone, to be the authority figure in the house. The mamas are having to do it. And a lot of times I'm thinking, I'm afraid they just get tired. They just get tired. You know, the one thing I do think about often, I'm here today, I'm here today because of my mother. She had a choice. Mothers have had a choice. They've always had a choice whether they carry the children or not. I am so thankful that she did. Uh, I am so thankful that she did. And it's amazing to me how many people argue with me about that, uh, the, the idea of the hurting the innocent. So let's talk about motherhood a little bit. Notice the managers of, of the home. This is something that our country has kind of gotten away from, too. Um, in Proverbs 31 at verse 27, now Proverbs 31, it's, it talks, you're talking about a chapter about women and the great qualities of women, good, good qualities of women, qualities women ought to have. Proverbs 31, is that whole chapter is filled with that. Verse 27, notice some of the qualities. She, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. She looks well. The idea there is to, to lean over, to peer, to observe. She is watching. And not only that, but this word ways has the idea of the way you walk. Watch it, a uh, marching. The mother looks at what her kids are doing. She looks at the way of the house and she says, we need to do this and we need to do that. She uh, watches that. She's observing, you know, and she's taking care of the kids. She's, she's like the mama hen, if you will. She's like the mama of the puppies. She cares about that. She's, uh, you know, very interested in what they're doing. Verse 28 says her husband, excuse me, her children, rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. I think it's interesting that word there is the same word we get hallelujah from, halal. He praises her. He sings his praises. He sings her praises, excuse me. Talks about how much she does, the things that she does. And I'm, I'm thankful for this day in that we do take time to stop for a minute and say, you know what, Mom, I am thankful for you. I may not say that all the time, and I don't really need a day to make me do that, but it does help remind me to do that. Because sometimes we just take our mothers and our fathers for granted. We just suppose that they're always going to be there. I think sometimes it, uh, it takes a realize, realization that they won't always be there to help us in, in that. Notice 1 Timothy 5, verse 14. Some of the responsibilities that Paul is talking to this young preacher. He says, encourage the young ladies. This is how they need to behave. He says, <coughs> excuse me, I will therefore that the younger women, first of all, they marry. It's a sad situation in our nation when marriage is no longer looked at with regard. I mean, now I was excited to get married. I'm not sure how excited my wife was. But I was real excited. We waited seven and a half years. Yes, that's right. You heard me right. We waited. We dated for seven and a half years. It was a running joke in her family that we were going to wait for our first Social Security check before we got married. Seven and a half years. I would have married her when I was 15. I kid you not. When we first met. But her mama wouldn't let us, so uh, there, there's that. But um, I was happy for that. Young ladies look forward to getting married. At least they used to. Now everybody looks at it as something cumbersome. I'm not sure I really want to be tied down. I'm not sure I really want you, you hear that? That the family, that the structure of the family is a tie down. It's going to inconvenience me. I'm going to be required to do things and stuff. That So what does that say? What is the bottom line problem with that? Them's my toys. This is my time, my house. I want to do what I want. It's all about who? me. you talking about a selfish society. That's all we're about. Instead of saying what we can give, it's what can I get. And it amazes me as I watch the politics of our nation. It's all about what will you give me? Not what are we going to expect of our fellow countrymen. Not when are we going to expect everybody to do their part. What can I do? What is my responsibility? It's not that what are you going to give me? 
What can I have and what can I get out of? Young ladies, to marry. Responsibility. Responsibility. To bear children. That's the, the focus of the home. God made a man and he made a woman. She is the help meet. But it's a natural response to that togetherness, the two becoming the one flesh. Children are born into a relationship, and God says that is good. That's the way he made it. That's where children are supposed to be born, and they are to be nurtured by their daddies and their mothers. But this word right here, guide the house, it is a really cool word in the Greek. I don't know a lot of Greek words. I've spent a lot of time studying that language, but I'll be honest with you, I don't speak it. I don't read it every single day. But I, I can recognize certain words because I go by Walmart and there's a yogurt called oikos. And I know immediately, hey, that word means house. I, that meant a lot to me when I first started taking Greek. But I've also heard of a despot. You ever heard of a despot? A despot today is uh, somebody, you know, an angry, you know, ruler. But, you know, it used to just mean a ruler. And so this is a compound word in the Greek. You have oika and then you have despote, despoto. And what you have is the ruler of the house. Well, who's that? Paul says, therefore, that the younger women marry, bow children, rule the house. And boy, aren't we thankful that that's the way, that's the way that it works. Bless my wife's heart. I love her to death. And she has the neatest ideas and wants to do this and put things here and decorate this and decorate that. And uh, I'm not much support in that. I'll just have to admit, I'm sorry, hon, but I'm not. I'm like, why well, we got to change that? Why don't we just leave it like it is? She says, well, it'd be prettier this. I'm like, well, you know, who cares, you know? Well, she cares. And aren't we thankful that they care? Because us guys, can you imagine what our whole house would be a garage? This room here is for my yard equipment. Yeah, that's right. I have a bed over here, my riding lawnmower there, keep my weed eater hanging over here, keep my extra line underneath my filler. You know, you never know when you might need that. That's how we'd run a house. It'd be, it'd be terrible. And the Lord knew that. He says, you let the ladies run the house, you fellas get out. Go out there and work. Do something constructive, you know. And so I, I love that. Guide the house. And give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. That's what great advice. That's, that's, that's Bible. That's how God sees motherhood. That's how God sees motherhood. Notice also in Proverbs 31, continuing. She is not afraid of snow for her household, for all her household are clothed in scarlet. In other words, she's prepared. She has her children prepared. She thinks about things such as that. And that's, that's one of the roles there. Her priorities, notice, are in order. She has pursuits outside the home now. The home is not her whole life. She has pursuits outside. Notice Proverbs uh, verse 16 of that same chapter. She considers a field. In other words, she thinks about it and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She works. She works outside the home. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers satchels to the merchants. In other words, it's not just all about what she does at home. She's got pursuits outside the home as well, and she does things to take care of her family. Such a woman is a compliment to her, uh, to her husband. Notice the Bible says her husband is known in the gates. Now, uh, we probably put that something like her husband's known with the people that run the town, if you will. They didn't have like a county courthouse, you know, the county, uh, you know, how we have ours, just about every county in Tennessee. You can find the, the courthouse. You just go to where all the roads run to and make a, make a square, you know. On the courthouse lawn, that, that's kind of what the gates were for them. It says her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. And folks, the elders there know him too. And they know about his wife. And they know that she's a good woman. And they know that he is following along and going to be what he ought to be one day and be right there helping to lead the town. Such a woman contributes to the bright future of her family. Notice this, Proverbs 31:25. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. That doesn't mean she's flippant. The uh, good word, uh, God's word translation says smiles at the future. The contemporary English says she's cheerful about the future. She's not making fun or just saying, I ain't going to worry about it. She looks forward to it because she knows she's prepared. She's done the things necessary, and her family can be successful and do the things that they need to do. A model of obedience. Turn with me. Uh, well, let's, first of all, let's look at James. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. That's a Christian responsibility. All of us are supposed to be submitting type people. The idea of being a Christian is to disciple yourself after the Christ, submitting to his will. 
Now notice with me, if you will, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at two passages. This is the first one, 1 Peter 3, and then the next one will be in Timothy. It'll just be a few pages over. Those of you who remember what the Bible is, if you don't, that's that black book in front of you there on the thing. If you, did, if you forgot your cell phone this morning or it's dead. 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at it with me. Likewise. Now he's been talking about uh, various things here, servants and so forth. And then he says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the saints or conversation of the wives. Notice the word conversation. King James always means manner of life. He's saying that, ladies, you have an influence on your husband. He pays attention to what you do. And you can win your husband to Christ simply by being the type of woman that you should be, being a godly woman. I'm going to tell you something. My wife has had a tremendous influence on me. As a child, when we were just growing up, just started dating, she had an influence on me. I respected her. I, I wouldn't do things that she didn't want me to do. And sometimes I'd do things she didn't want me to do just to tick her off. You ever do that, guys? I know you don't. That's just something I do, right? Yeah. We would do things, you know, we call it punching each other's buttons. We know exactly which buttons to do. And I'll show her. But because of her patience and her love for me, even though sometimes I was doing things she didn't want me to do, you know how you ladies are. You don't have to actually say anything. You just, the way you look and the way you carry, that has an influence on the men. And we all want to please our wives. If we're, you know, the kind of men we ought to be, we want to please our wives. And so you have an influence on us. That's exactly what this is saying. Verse 2. While they, the husbands, behold your chaste manner of life, coupled with fear. In other words, you don't stay at home from services just because uh, you want to. Your husband's watching you. Your husband's watching you when it comes to Bible study and worship. He looks and sees how dedicated you are. And after a while, he sees how dedicated you are. He might want and probably will want to investigate just exactly why that is. Get to know the people that you know. Get to talk about the things that you talk about that interest you. And it's like, you know, when it's Bible and when it's Christian, you know, the church and so forth, that has an influence on a man. And notice verse 3, who's adorning, let it not be with outward adorning, of plating the hair. Now, ladies, that doesn't mean you can't go get your hair done. All right, you can go get your hair done. Because he's not speaking literally here. He says, and of wearing of gold, don't take your wedding bands off, okay? Wear that, that's fine, because we know he's not speaking literally here. Because if that was the case, all of you would be naked this morning because you wouldn't have put on any apparel. Notice what he says. Or of putting on of apparel. So when you see people out here that don't wear makeup, have their hair, you know, in a, usually in a bun and things of that nature, don't, you know, and just think it's evil if you do anything like that, notice what he's talking about here. Don't dress showy. In other words, don't dress it to bring attention to yourself. But at the same time, dress modestly is the idea. Verse 4, but let the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women who also trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. In other words, he was saying, let your life be that outward adorning, adorning that people look at. Be, you, let your life be the thing that draws people's attention to you, not the big old heavy jewelry and the wild you know, makeup that you wear. That's not what the kind of attention you want to draw. Models of obedience, that's the idea here. Turn with me over to Titus now, just a few pages back. Won't ask you to turn no more. I know we're fingers are probably getting tired. Notice Titus chapter 2 here, beginning with verse 3. The aged women. Now, it would be very dangerous for me to point out some folks in here and say, that's you. All right, so I'm not going to say that. But let's just get the idea of the older women. Likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. Why? People are watching you. They knows a lot of times those little people are living with you. Sometimes they're in your Bible class. Sometimes they go to church with you. You be as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be what? Sober, 
to love their husbands. You realize you teach people how to love? You know, my <clears throat> in my own family, my my father, he, he would talk about how much that he loved me. He would talk about things like that nature. But he didn't know how to love. And, uh, and I loved him. But part of loving your family, loving your children, is being there with them, the sense of providing, the sense of having stability, the sense of being there. And it's one thing to tell somebody you love them, and yet they never see you, you never give anything towards their support, and you're not there for them. You see, that's, it's one thing to say, but it's another thing to do. And so the older women, you need to teach the young women how to love their, uh, how to love their husbands. First of all, that's says you be faithful. You don't have to be the best wife in the world, but you can be faithful. Not only that, but you look towards the interest of the family. You give up self, and you help him. And he, in turn, will do the same if he's the kind of man that he ought to be. You teach the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Now, that's one thing to say, oh, come here, buddy, you know, and grab hold and smoochie, smoochie, and you just say, oh, I just love him to death. Then you don't feed him. You don't make sure that he has proper clothes. You don't make him go to school. You don't discipline him, things of that nature. That's not love. Love contains that very element of providing, of taking care, of nurturing. And, of course, the Bible will go on to say that in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, not only to love their children, but to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Boy, I tell you what, a statement like that today will get you, uh, get you rode pretty hard in our country. Don't be obedient. I ain't no dog. What do you mean I got to be obedient? By the bitch? You know, you'll have people immediately make fun of that. Folks, uh, the, the home is just like any other institution. It has, to be, it has to run properly. You can't have two heads of a state. You can't have two heads of, an, of, a, of a business. You've got to have one head. And that's how God set up the home. And that's the way it is designed to run. And motherhood is a model of obedience. That's where children learn to be obedient. Mothers should be teachers of good things. And, of course, this reflects on God's original plan for the family, which our nation has forgot all about. The Bible is full with admonitions for us to listen to our mamas. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, forsake not the law of thy mother. Verse 31, King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Deuteronomy 5, verse 16, honor thy father and thy mother as the Lord thy God hath commanded thee. And we call that what? The fifth of the ten commandments. The Bible's chock full of it. Listen to your mamas. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for that's right. This is right, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Teaching done, mostly by example. Action not in line in words is a violation in Matthew chapter 7, which teaches us that you be a hypocrite. You can't say one thing and then do another. If you want your children to be the kind of people they ought to be, then you have to be the kind of person you'd have them to be. Examples, we think of Jochebed and her children, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, great people. They can all look back to their mom. Well, think about Timothy's mother and grandmother. Notice he talks about, Paul talks about the unfeigned faith that is in Timothy, and he said it was found first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. They had an influence on that young man. Just about every good thing you can think of, though, has a flip side. Some mothers do not live up to this, and instead of being bright blossoms, they are bed plants, if you will. I have seven, I think, reasons here. Notice some of these. Must be mothers and fathers. That's, a ter that's why some things just don't work today. Mamas aren't supposed to be daddies, but a lot of times they're forced into that situation. Many have to work, leaving the children to raise themselves. That's where we are today in our country. Many think more of their careers. I'm not talking about everybody. But there's a lot of ladies that are far more interested in how far they get up the corporate ladder and in power and in things of that nature than they are of their family. Many have abandoned discipline. Many have abandoned instruction. A lot of mothers just don't want to be mothers. Hence the... Uh, Problems we have. Many do not want to look at the mother's manual. And of course, it's the same manual that fathers have. And it's called the Word of God. That's how we raise our kids. That's where we go to see the very things that we should do. Examples of some good mothers. We don't have time to look at those in depth. But married mother of God, mother of Jesus. Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother. Lois and Eunice, of course, Timothy's mother. Hannah, Samuel's mother. Great examples. But on the other hand, 
Of course, you know, you think about Jezebel for a minute. How many girls have you met? How many ladies in our country have you met and their names are Jezebel? Well, we don't, don't do that, do we? Jezebel, we think of Herodias, who would have her daughter ask for the head of John the Baptist on the chargers. That's a couple examples of some ladies that just wasn't what they ought to be. Which kind of mother would you like to be? So blockades to hell, our parents for sure and our mothers for sure. Young ladies, that's the greatest responsibility you'll have on this earth. I don't care if you grow up to be a doctor or whatever. Or your, your greatest responsibility will be raising your family, being that kind of mother that you need to be. There's a fellow by the name of Paul Bear Bryant. I know I've already got half of the audience's attention just like that. Bear Bryant made a telephone commercial for South Central Bell years ago. I looked everywhere to try to find the date that that was filmed, but I could not find it. But, uh, of course, <clears throat> you, you can go to YouTube. You can watch it right now. Don't do it right now, but, you know, maybe have services that you can watch it. One of the things I found very, very interesting was he talks about when our young players, our freshmen come in, the first thing we do, we make them sit down and we make them write out a postcard and tell them about how great things here are <laughs> at Alabama. He doesn't say that, but he says we mean to tell them how they're doing. And he says they always have an opportunity to call. And he was supposed to say in that typical Bear Bryant Southern draw, call your mama. But he didn't say that. Off the cuff, he says at the end of that, have you called your mama today? I sure wish I could call mine. Those of us that can call ours, that are still alive, let's make sure we don't pass up an opportunity such as today to make that phone call. Because there'll be a time when you won't be able to do that. That is the nature of things, and that's just the way it is. Thank God for mamas. Thank God for godly mothers and fathers. If you're here this morning and you're not a member of the Lord's Church, Rest assured, I'm just going to tell you as straight as I can, you cannot be a mama, you cannot be the kind of daddy that God would have you to be if you're not a Christian. Because the whole reason that you're here on the face of this earth is to fear God and keep his commandments. And you can't teach your children that if you're not living that. That is your responsibility. And if those little ones, those little ones don't see heaven, don't let it be because you weren't the kind of example you ought to be. It's a simple process. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Most of you wouldn't be here this morning if you didn't. Are you willing to confess his name before men, changing your life to be the kind of people that you ought to be? Then you're ready to be baptized. The Lord said he'll take care of the rest of it. He'll clean you up. He'll add your name to the Lamb's Book of Life. He'll put you into the church. Then you begin that process. Sometimes in the walks of life, though, we can forget our ways. We can get covered up with this world. It's never too late to come back home if you're an erring child of God. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.